From marauders and king's retinue to bloodthirsty, frothing at the mouth savages, let us talk about everybody's favorite TTRPG mid shield, the Berserker. Hello everyone, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode. I really missed you, how are you? Last week I was completely derailed by the fact that I had to return to the office for a whole week and I couldn't find the time nor the energy to paint and to do a video. But I plan on making it up to you this week with an awesome miniature and an interesting video. So stick around and let's talk about the origins of the Barbarian class, especially the Berserker. Before we jump in our story, let me introduce the miniature I will be painting today. This is Gutrags, the Stitch Golem from Reaper Minis, an awesome little miniature that I tremendously enjoyed painting. Now, do me a favor, if at any point you like this video, hit that like button, subscribe and share it with your friends, your players, your DMs, your GMs, your neighbors, everyone, and let's talk about what my plans are for this miniature. And then we can start our story. For this mini I started with my now favorite Pebeo black paint as a base coat. Next time I do have to remember that not all paints apply really well from the get-go, so I do have to wash the mini beforehand. Of course I then went with a zenithal priming, but I added an extra step. I added an intermediate administratum grey layer before coming in with a Pebeo white paint directly from above, catching the raised areas, leaving much of the grey in place. This was done to smooth the transition between the lightest and the darkest areas. When it comes to the color scheme, I went all over the place. Seeing how this is a cloth or a rag golem, I took inspiration from around my house. Kitchen towels, towels towels, my favorite socks, potatoes favorite blanket, etc. I want this miniature to be very colorful and cheery, and I want it to lull my players into a false sense of safety. I want them to be really frightened when this colorful bad golem makes its first attack and they are not prepared for it. As for the story, now that that's out of the way, let's go through the checklist. I have some delicious coffee in my mug. I have some amazing orange infusion tea in my mousse cup. I have, as always, something something for the soul. And my assistants are actually eating right now. And that's why they're not around me. How about you? Are you comfy? Are you cozy? Do you have something very nice to drink on hand? Perfect. Then, I think it's time for a story. The Barbarian is a cult classic, and this is not something recent, oh no. From the Middle Ages, the bloodthirsty frenzied warriors are mentioned and described in several sources. From Berserkers and Ulhednar, Conan and Grog more recently, you have to admit, having such warriors in stories adds a good dose of adrenaline. I plan on taking you on an interesting journey of talking about what scholars have managed to find out about Berserkers and what writings from across the time turned them into. So let's see where all these stories come from and to do so I will turn to a book written by Roderick Dale called The Myths and Realities of the Viking Berserkers, an awesome study on the different roles and facets of Berserkers. I will heavily rely on this book for this video as I find it to be very very informative, very well documented and it is written in a style very close to my own actually so I'm a little bit biased but also because um, the information contained in this story is something that I have already learned to a certain extent while in university. I will also rely on the videos of Dr. Jackson Crawford, a specialist in Old Norse language, mythology and culture. You can find his videos on YouTube and believe me, they are very, very informative. As a disclaimer, I will be butchering a lot of the names and terms as they are in Old Norse or more recent Norse, so I will have to ask you to bear with me. Oh, and using these sources, I will contradict most of the beliefs you have about Berserkers. So, I guess, enjoy? Now, let's start talking about Berserkers and Ulf Hednar. Although they are different in some few aspects, they share most traits and they are both, well, Berserkers. So, moving forward, I will be calling all of them Berserkers. And if there are any notable differences, I will make sure to point them out. The name Berserker is a compound word, meaning it is uh, composed of two or more words. Berserker comes from Serker, meaning shirt, and Bear. But here we stumble upon the first clue as to why they are depicted either as frenzied madmen or as bear-like warriors. 
Ber can mean bear, as in the animal, from bernus in Proto-Norse, or bear, as in naked. Based on the sources, unfortunately, both origins of the word are valid. The name of these warriors could mean bear shirt, as in wearing the skin of a bear, or bear shirt, meaning shirtless or naked. As I said, based on the sources, both interpretations are valid, but only to an extent. In favor of the interpretation of bear shirt comes the parallel word wolfhedden, meaning wolf shirt, the other kind of barbarian warrior I just mentioned. And of course, we have sources that support the idea of them fighting shirtless. In the Inglinga saga, Snorri Sturluson, the Norse poet, describes these warriors, the berserkers, and their frenzy, their berseksgangr a gift from Odin. He mentions that this gift, this frenzy, makes them resistant to fire and iron and makes them fight wildly. Snorri also mentions them fighting without armor, reinforcing the idea again that they fought perhaps naked. But this is one of the very very few sources that actually mention this. As you can see we have the same thing in Dungeons and Dragons for example, raging or frenzying, making barbarians resistant to different types of damage. As a side note, but a very important side note, in Old Norse, the word berserker used to describe someone was not a compliment. On the contrary, it was used in a not derogatory means necessary, but to describe not very good individuals, just like the term Viking or Viking. But that's another story for another time. After looking at the etymology of the word, we can conclude that most of the times they are depicted as a combination of the two origins, at least in our times. Fighting almost naked and sporting only bare skins, perhaps only to cover their heads or something. But now let's turn our attention to the sources and how they are described. In Harald's Kevedi, they are depicted as shouting and howling when fighting, perhaps in a, an attempt of intimidating their opponent. This was mentioned as a defining aspect of the berserkers. Being so emphasized, I personally believe that it was much more intense and bestial, well beyond what you would normally expect during a battle in the Middle Ages. But when it comes to actual fighting, they did so in shield wall formations, as opposed to their modern depictions as being very individualist, individualist warriors who engaged on one on one. The side by side shield wall style of engagement does not go well with the idea of giving in to rage and unbridled frenzy. I hope you agree. Now, there are a number of sources that mention berserkers, and from them, scholars have extracted several roles that they are mentioned to have fulfilled. First off, let us talk about the king's berserkers. Berserkers were considered elite warriors and as such, they would be tasked with protecting the king and other rulers, noblemen and their realms. They were a member of the royal retinue and part of the army. They were feared and respected for their role and importance. The most important sources that mention berserkers in this role is the work of Saxo Grammaticus Gesta Danorum. Besides being part of a ruler's retinue, they would usually be placed where the battle would be the fiercest, but a ruler might also rent out the services of his berserkers to other rulers or noblemen when the ruler couldn't answer a call for aid himself. You might think that they were perhaps treated like mercenaries, but it was a pretty common practice for a king to rent the services of his soldiers for additional income, at least in the Viking Age. There are sources where the berserkers are shown as a counter to the hero. They are an obstacle that the champion or hero has to overcome to prove their worth and gain the recognition they deserve. They are a very important part in the journey of a hero, the initiation journey that can be found in the folklore of all human cultures. With that explanation, let's talk about the next kind of berserker, the whole challenging berserker. These are individuals who play the role of the obstacle in folklore stories. They are said to arrive usually at Yuletide in midwinter, infiltrate great halls uninvited and start challenging those who attended celebrations. They provoke the participants to feast to admit they are better than the, the berserkers, they are taunting the participants. And once someone claims that yes, they are better than the berserker, the berserker would attack and try and kill them. 
In these stories, the hero is a participant in the feast or celebration and is unremarkable or even considered lazy or unfit, being treated poorly, having food thrown at them, having drinks thrown at them. The moment the berserker challenges them to admit that they are better, the hero actually defeats the berserker or the berserkers, depending on the story, and thus gains their well-deserved place and prove their value and are cheered by the other participant at the feast. Okay, I think this is a great moment for a break from our story, so let's talk about the miniature. Oh, and if you want to see more of Mango and Potato's adventures, because they aren't around me, make sure you check out TW Creative hyphen or minus Cats, a channel with shorts that has nothing to do with history and everything to do with cat adventures. Enjoy. I decided to go with pure colors straight out of the bottle at first as I want to get the whole picture, see what am I working with and see what matches and what doesn't. I will add highlights in the end, but first I want to apply all the colors, just get it out of the way. Not all of them have a great coverage to be honest, so I do have to return multiple times and add layer after layer before I'm happy with the results. Apparently I do have bad luck when it comes to oranges and yellows, so if you know a brand that makes good yellows and oranges, I would be very grateful if you share it into the comments. Oh, and the Elemental Bolt War Paint from the Ami Painter is so so transparent, I was really surprised. Now we get to see the nastier side of Berserkers, and for that we need to talk about the Duelist Berserkers. I won't even attempt to pronounce their Old Norse name, I, I'm sorry, no. But they roam the land and challenge farmers to duels for their farms, their properties, or their female relatives, or even both. The sources fail to mention what the farmer wins if he defeats the berserker, but one might speculate that the farmer gets to live. Now, in this case we again encounter the story of the hero, but no, the farmer is not actually the hero in disguise. The hero of the saga happens to be passing by or knows the farmer somehow and accepts the berserker's challenge in the farmer's name becoming the farmer's champion. Because the hero of course wins, he gains the hand of a female relative of the farmer in marriage and also receives some property from the farmer. So basically everything that the berserker would have gained if the farmer was defeated in battle. But it's a story. One of the best examples of this comes from Egil's saga. In this saga, Egil, who is the champion of a farmer, does not want to marry the farmer's daughter. Plot twist. Instead, asks the farmer to lay claim on the berserker's wealth on his behalf. What is interesting is that under the Norwegian law, there was a legal status, Holmfer, or fit to fight in uh, Holmganga. So, in plain terms, in medieval Norway, it is most likely that the duels against berserkers were seen as a way to prove that the son was worthy of inheritance from his father when the time came. But apparently, this test was very problematic in the early 11th century, as I'm sure you might see. Later sources, like the Gretis Saga, mentions that the um, Holmganga was abolished in Norway in the 11th century. The text reads as follows. It seems a great disgrace to men in the land that raiders or berserkers challenged noblemen to duels for their money or women. Each one who fell before the other should die without compensation. Many got disgrace and loss of valuables from this and some loss of life along with the rest, and for that reason, Eirik Jarl abolished all duels in Norway. He also made outlaws of all those bandits and berserkers who made trouble. There is an interesting twist though. This is the only surviving source from that time that mentions an attempt at outlawing Honganga in Norway. There is a belief that instead of this being an actual remembered historical uh, law past, instead it is a fantastical creation that simply furthers the narrative of the saga, in this case the Gretis saga. Because there are so many sagas that depict berserkers as dueling people for their goods or female relatives, it is possible that medieval saga authors believe that this practice was part of the usual activities or even duties of a berserker. Moreover, the Holmganga was a form of trial by combat, and not all duels involved berserkers, and not all Holmgangas were with or against berserkers. 
Egil Saga mentions that anyone not happy with the outcome of a trial could ask for a trial by combat. And one last thing, dualist berserkers could hold property and live in society, thus wanting to take property from weaker men. They were not outlaws, but considered assholes who used the law for their own benefit. I think I failed to mention earlier, but the term Viking was also not necessarily a ter term of endearment. So when combined with that of Berserker, we get a double whammy. So let's talk about Viking Berserkers. These individuals would raid, pillage and kill for their own gains. They would usually organize in larger groups or units of Viking Berserkers. They might have been from time to time in the service of a king or a ruler and would share their loot as to increase the income of the ruler. And they were also used as weapons to weaken rival rulers. But the case of being in employment of a ruler were not necessarily that common. Most Viking berserkers would pillage, loot and kill for their own immediate gain. They were considered even more dangerous than the duelist berserker because of, well, common sense. If you have one asshole, one duelist that challenges farmers or weaker individuals and take their property, sure, you might be able to deal with that individual and take them out. But if you outlaw dwelling berserkers and force them to the fringes of society, they will simply go a viking. You have several such individuals who would unite their forces for protection and for increased strength that would wreak havoc in society. Examples of such groups of Viking Berserkers are described in the Orvar Od Saga, Gongu Hrolf's Saga and several others. And finally, we come to the last category of Berserkers identified by Roderick Dale and that is the Christian Berserkers. Surprise! It might sound strange because, let's be honest, up until now we saw how the Berserkers were depicted in a negative light, so it is perhaps hard to understand how the story and the role could be spun around and turned into something positive. They do not seem to embody the traits that Christians like to see themselves as having. But surprisingly enough, we do have sources that show these Berserkers as being the good guys. For example, we had the 13th century Barlam's Oak Josaphatus Saga. <laughs> In this tale, the Christian Antonius is referred to as a berserker when he fights off devils. The quote is as follows. But Jesus Christ did not forget the duel of his berserker. This shows us that the berserker could be considered a miles Christi, a knight of Christ, fighting in the name of Christian God. Another berserker is mentioned in this saga, the one that names the story actually, uh, Josapha, Josaphat, 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 and Josaphat, Josaphat, that guy, and is called God's Young Berserker. This whole story apparently is a Christianized version of a story of the Buddha, so the Berserker is not a warrior of Odin, but of God. Just to clear things up or muddy them even further, at one point Odin was considered an Asian shaman and a practitioner of black magic and that is the link with the Buddha. Very complex, so it's another story for another time because I need much more time on this before I can actually start talking about it in an informed manner. As you can see, this is a view pretty far removed from what the pre-Christian berserkers were, especially in the sense that the berserker lacks the negative connotation that it used to have, now being one of God's warriors. And to better highlight the shift in attitude towards berserkers from pre-Christian times to those in the late medieval times, we have a quote from Calamagnus Saga. I know this one, it's Charlemagne's Saga. And in this one, the emperor's paladin, Roland, after Bishop Turpin fell in battle, speaks over his body saying, you have long been a great berserker against the pagan men. By the way, if you want to know more about the first paladins in history led by Roland, I just mentioned him, at Charlemagne's court, make sure you check out my video on paladins, link is right over there. Okay, so what can we gather from these examples is that the idea of battle frenzied, 
rage-fueled wild warriors who sported bear or wolf skins, tore off their armor and leaped into battle with no regard for their own safety nor that of their comrades was not real, at least not in the literal sense. Of course, perhaps there were individuals who did this, but the main roles berserkers played were that of soldiers in a ruler's retinue and that of duelists, taking property and or women from weaker men, but they were almost always portrayed as bad guys, but rarely as crazy bad guys. I guess it's time to turn our attention to the rage-fueled crazed warrior that we come to love, but before we do so, let's take a short break, see how the miniature is coming along, and then we'll return shortly. In the meanwhile, leave a comment down below as I'm really curious to know your thoughts thus far about Berserkers. I changed the color of the right upper arm three times, eventually landing on a combination of Frost Blue from MSP Bones and Pebeo White. The previous two colors really didn't work that well for me, but now to think about it, the sickly brownish pink from before worked better. It took a few thin layers of the frost blue and white combo, as the pink was very determined to show through. But I'm very happy with the results and pretty happy overall. Oh, and I ended up mixing Elemental Bolt with Cabalite Green to increase the opacity. Now, let's get back to the story. Okay, let's see why and how the Berserkers came to be considered monstrous, and believe me, it's not what you'd expect. According to Dale, it's their animalistic ferocity, their superhuman powers and their subhuman behavior that makes them monstrous and threatening. They would break social norms, although still within the boundaries of the law, as we saw with the duelist, this is mainly what made them that feared. The whole challenger would enter holes and start challenging and quarreling and attacking participants. The duelist would take women as prizes and property from other individuals. They would become outlaw that banded together and terrorized communities. In addition, according to Snorri Sturluson, wearing animal skins, howling and growling, using even powers granted by Odin to become resistant to fire and iron, all of this struck fear in society. But all of these are representations from the late medieval period, written down by Snorri himself. But what about their contemporaries? What did they see when looking upon berserkers? Research into sources revealed that they indeed lived on the edge of society, on its fringes, not really being part of it that much, especially given their behavior, of course people tended to steer clear of them. Now, let's break down what made Berserkers monstrous in the view of the medieval Norse audience of Saga. First off, their ethnicity, strangely enough. Some of the Berserkers encountered in Sagas were Swedish, highlighting the dislike the Norwegians had for the Swedes in those times, painting them as not really that civilized. The dislike was most likely based around territorial disputes and the fact that Sweden was Christianized later than Norway and as such, animosity brewed between Christians and Pagans. The sagas mentioned thus far were written down around the 13th century CE and made a point of depicting berserkers as being Swedish intentionally. But of course there were berserkers of other ethnicities too, Norwegians, Russians and Icelanders. It's just that Icelanders considered Norway their original homeland and they were more sympathetic towards them and for example, would not write nasty things about the berserkers from Norway. But on closer inspection, in reality, based on their names and based on their descriptions and backstories, most berserkers were Norwegian, with the Icelanders coming in hot on second place. A second way of accentuating the monstrous nature of berserkers was their immunity to fire and iron, as mentioned by Snorri. In the Vatsn... Vatn's De La Saga, I'm, I'm just gonna write it here. Two berserkers wade through burning flames with bare feet, reinforcing the idea of this supernatural resistance. But there is a saga, the Nils Saga, where a berserker would not cross a fire consecrated by a Christian missionary. This episode serves to show that Christian missionaries were much more powerful than pagan rage-fueled berserkers. According to Dale, 
the ability to walk on burning coals is akin to that of Indian yogis and could be a part of some religious ecstasy or a rite of initiation and or a way to show courage and intimidate the onlookers or even opponents. Or perhaps more poetic, by vowing not to fear iron nor fire, the berserker hopes to be granted invulnerability to them. Their invulnerability to iron is often translated into a resistance to blades, and thus, sources mention that berserkers would be clubbed to death with the use of spiked clubs. It was said that their gaze would also blunt swords and blades, but in all fairness, it is most likely that the animal hide armors that they wore could actually save them from edged weapons. Bear or wolf skin armor could save them from the cut of a blade, but most definitely would not be able to save them from the blunt force trauma of a weapon, such as a club, because such armors are quite flexible and being not rigid, actually it's very hard to disperse the force of the impact. It's like the gambeson. Blades would have a very hard time cutting all the way through, but the mace would really deal some damage. They were also mentioned to, as an act of intimidation, chew on the edge of their shields, all the while howling like animals. In the Greti saga, there is a quote that reads, Then the sons of Angrim drew their swords and bit their shields and began Berserk's Gangr, or entering Berserk Frenzy. Howling is usually part of the Berserk's Gangr, but apparently it was not limited to Berserkers, as you might expect. But the simple act of howling and or growling right before battle would most certainly bolster one's courage. And the symbol of a wolf or a bear, animals that berserkers associated with, could have an impact on their behavior and their resolve. An act of mimesis that would enhance their ferocity in battle and intimidate their opponents, acting like a bear or a wolf. And the growling that was mentioned could also be the low chanting of spells or prayers to protect the warrior in battle. Actually, a few centuries before berserkers and um, Vikings in general, Tacitus, the ancient author, mentions that Germanic warriors would often use their shields as sounding boards, making their voices sound more frightening. Now, picture this. You're marching through a deep, dark, ancient forest, or even a medieval forest, and from all around you, you start hearing all these deep, low, guttural voices, these chants, these growls. It would be very, very frightening, no matter how well equipped you are, no matter how well trained you are, you would most definitely shit your pants. This works by placing the mouth very close to the rim of the shield, shouting, chanting, growling, making your voice scary, all the while giving the impression of biting the shield because you're very close to the rim. And there is one mention in Old Norse literature of berserkers foaming at the mouth, and the quote goes like this. They nod on their shield rims and froth gushed from their mouths. But there is only this one source, this one mention, and it is a means to indicate to the audience their animal nature, their bestial behavior, reminiscent of a rabbit dog, not necessarily actually frothing at the mouth. But this one singular mention was enough to paint the picture that we have today of berserkers. Now that's very... that's amazing. The Berserkers and Wulfhenar were also mentioned to be able to shapeshift, leading to the idea in the 19th century that they were werewolves. By the way, I do have an episode on werewolves, if you want to check it out later, link right over there. This comes from the way the sagas were translated and the interpretation some terms were given. The idea is that for a period, scholars believed that Berserkers could change shape and shift into that of an animal. But the term is more properly interpreted as being able to take on an animal persona, or don the skin of another creature, not actually transforming into that creature. The term could be translated into 
putting on the pelt of another creature, or leaving the body and entering a new shape. This is a problem that occurred in the medieval sagas, and I personally believe it is simply a literally um, embellishment. They took on the skins of creatures and started behaving like them, appearing more animalistic, more frightening to the onlookers. It was a mental transformation and not a physical one. And in order to support this, I bring a new argument to the table. There is no such thing as werewolves. Never have been, never will be. Well, hopefully. But there is no such thing as werewolves. Why would they be able to transform? Anyway, I think this is a perfect moment to take a break, talk about the mini and come back and talk about going berserk. In the meanwhile, I would very much like to hear your thoughts on werewolves, on um, frothing at the mouth, on knowing shields and everything. And what do you think about using shields as sounding boards? That's quite interesting, at least in my opinion. Now, leave a comment down below, let's go to the miniature and then we'll come back. Now for the grand finale, adding the details that will make this miniature pop and bring everything together. Every rag and cloth end up with a pattern, checkered, flowered, dots, lines, bullseyes, double lines, you name it. And seeing how it was St. Valentine's Day, I tried my hand at some hearts that end up looking really bad, so I just turned them all into colorful circles. Oh, and I'm sure that all of these patterns actually have names, but I don't know them and I got lazy and didn't look them up. I tried to go for contrasting colors in some cases, but in the end I went with the source material or with what I felt looked good. I'm really really happy with this miniature and it ended up in my top 5 thus far. I hope you enjoyed the painting process too. Okay, now back to the story. Finally, let us talk about the now famous line I would like to rage. Going berserk. Raging. Going in a frenzy. There are, of course, multiple explanations for this uh, aberrant behavior, so let's go quickly through them because they are kind of self-explanatory. Berserk's, Berserk's Gangre has been translated as Berserker Frenzy or Fury, but if we analyze the etymology of the word, we again have a compound word. Berserker, which, as stated previously, means bear shirt, and Gangre meaning walking, motion, movement. The literal translation of Berserker's Gangren is the movement of the Berserker. And seeing how the word originated in Old Norse and it had nothing to do with fits of rage or fury, why not take them at their word? The word has been associated with fits of rage later, in the Viking Age, in the works of Snorri and others. But this was several hundred years after the original works. Now, in Old Norse, Berserker Gangre was signaled to commence by several things, such as biting the shield, howling and growling. And this is a general depiction of a character for a particular audience. The movement of the Berserker included these elements and signaled a specific kind of episode within a story. That episode where the Berserker ends up defeated and killed by the hero. All studies on the Berserker Gang started from the premise that these individuals actually lost it and went into a frenzy, which is not the good working theory. It's like someone describing me as losing it when I'm pumping myself up before an important event. For example, before exams, I would blast certain songs to help me get in the zone. I breathed deeply, gave myself pep talks, growled a little, cast at the textbooks in an attempt of intimidating them so they would give up their secrets easier. Or describing the New Zealand rugby team, the All Blacks, losing it when performing the haka. I hope you get my point. But let's go through the different theories and in the end you tell me what you think is the most accurate one. Demons and black magic, <laughs> we're off to a good start. This one makes an appearance around the 17th century and as you can see it heavily leans in the realm of religion. The Scandinavians started searching around that time for a sense of self, for an identity, and started looking back at their ancestors and history. 
they found Vikings and Berserkers. These were good counterpoints to the civilized and educated society they found themselves in. The old gods were already considered demons or witches, and by using Snorri's Inglinga saga, they found some answers and explanations. Berserkers were Odin's men. Odin gave them the gift of fire and iron resistance. Now, just to be clear, this connection was made around 1627, so the image we now have about Berserkers was already gaining huge traction around that time. This theory was first put forth by the Danish historian Stefan Stefanius. The next theory, drugs, more specifically fly agaric mushroom, and this idea was first proposed in 1784 by Samuel Erdman. This idea was taken from the shamanic practices from the Siberian regions, but there are no mentions of such a thing in either Old Norse nor Viking Age sources. And apparently, the effect of Amanita muscaria or fly agaric mushroom were tested by experimenting on Ohio State Penitentiary prisoners in 1956, Jesus F. Christ. The results were clear. In small doses of an active ingredient that is found in this mushroom made the people experimented on quite happy, while large doses would induce hallucinations, but also intense nausea that would make warriors virtually useless on the battlefield. So there you have it. Mushrooms do not turn you into a berserker, at least not fly agaric. Alcohol. Well, have you ever gotten so drunk that you raged? Were you able to control your movements, your motion? The theory was put forth in the late 18th century. But anyway, there are no actual sources that mention such an occurrence. Drinking was enjoyed in a social, not ritual context by the Scandinavians in that age. Berserkers would drink until getting tired, but not until running amok. Another theory, physical pathologies. Epilepsy and rabies. Both were considered the root cause of the frenzy. There is only one mention of the Berserker Ganger being cured in Old Norse sources and thus cannot really be taken into account even if we consider it a disease. Only one account is not enough proof. Plus think about it. If it were any of these afflictions, why are the Berserkers only part of the Norse culture? Rabies killed pretty quickly. So you would have to have a constant influx of rabies infected people fighting in the army, which makes no sense. And there is only one mention of a berserker foaming at the mouth in Old Norse literature. We just spoke of that incident. Now, epilepsy. Why did they have so many people suffering from this affliction? Why weren't berserkers present in France, for example, or the Italian states in Spain, China, the Byzantine Empire, anywhere else? Surely other people had epilepsy too. Hell, Caesar is suspected to have suffered from epilepsy. I don't remember any Roman source describing him as going into a frenzy. And how come Berserker Gangre was cured with the Scandinavian states converting to Christianity? And don't tell me that God cured them. Strange diseases indeed. Plus, the rage could be summoned forth on command. That's not how any of these afflictions actually work. Both are debilitating. Kinda hard to have soldiers suffer from that and be effective constantly. All the strange things we now know of berserkers are skewed because between the Old Norse Scandinavia, the Viking Age Scandinavia, when berserkers were part of society and the moment most sagas that describe them were written down, we have several hundred years. Think of all the movies you see today about the world, let's say, 200 years ago. There are many misrepresentations, misjudgments, even an interest in showing things in a certain light. The same can be said about the sagas and berserkers. They were represented in a certain light, from an angle that made sense to an audience. 
The image we get about Berserkers suffered a very, very significant and fundamental transformation from the Old Norse sources to the Viking Age Scandinavian sources when we have new, more bestial representations to medieval sources that again transformed their depiction to the 17th century when their behavior was explained through a theological lens because it was significant at that moment to modern day studies where other explanations are given with for example the evolution of psychology a psychological explanation was given they suffered from different mental afflictions after world war one PTSD or shell shock was brought into discussion. Then, because it made sense, drugs were introduced as an explanation after the 1960s and nowadays we try to explain it as a disorder and so on and so forth. Who knows what the next, not trend, but the next significant leap in one um, domain will bring forth. All of these explanations are founded on the idea that the berserkers had somehow an aberrant behavior or that they suffered from something or they were under the influence but again there are many ways to carry out psychological warfare the romans used drilled sling projectiles that sounded like angry wasps many ancient armies used helmets decorated with plumes to appear taller Roman cavalry used metal masks to hide the motion and frighten the enemy. Elephants were used because they would frighten horses and men. Battle shouts and so on and so forth. I will do an episode on psychological warfare in ancient times, but that's another story for another time. The only thing pointing at a possible fit of rage is Snorri's account in the Heimskringla and he talks about them howling and biting their shields. The most likely explanation is that when we talk about the Berserker's fury, we should think of the battle fury or fervor many soldiers throughout the ages experience. And that all of the things described as being part of the rage were a performance for medieval audiences, exaggerations to embellish the stories. They recognized such a warrior without much need for a description. When a character walked in, tall, grim, clad in pelts, howling, biting their shield before engaging in battle, everyone immediately knew that that was a berserker. And let's be honest, taunting the opponent, trying to intimidate them, all the while encouraging your companions or teammates is something so innate to humans that we do it instinctually. The fact that we look at Snorri Sturluson's writings and take them literally without even batting an eye or wondering if it wasn't all hyperbole or a metaphor when describing a particular group of soldiers is fascinating and a little bit frightening. I'm sure you all at one point were asked in literature class, regardless of the language you are speaking, what a particular author wanted to say, what the hidden message was. You were asked to analyze metaphors. Even nowadays, we describe ourselves as being strong and healthy as a bull when reaching an old age and are still healthy. That person is not an actual bull. A hyperbole or a metaphor is used. But when it comes to Snorri's works, they are taken at face value, and as such, we got the berserker we know and love today. With all of that said, you can of course depict berserkers and barbarians in general exactly as you wish. I know I will continue describing them like they are in pop culture, but knowing where and why it all started makes it all the more fun. Anyway, with that, I think I bored you enough for one video. What do you think about all of this? Do you think that berserkers were actually crazed wild men? If you do, what makes you think that? Leave a comment down below as I'm really really curious to know what your thoughts on this are. And with that, I would like to thank you so much for the privilege of your time and I hope you found some inspiration and learned something new today. And I can't wait to see you all here next time on Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your dose of miniature painting, history, world building and trivia. Make sure you like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed this video. Remember, be curious. 
take inspiration from the past and never stop world building and creating amazing things. Your mind and imagination are wonderful. Have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Cheers. King or Adura? In addition, according to Snorri Stur... 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 Yeah.